Hey there, it's Kathy. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to History of the 90s early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. A listener's note. The following episode contains coarse language, adult themes, and content of a violent and disturbing nature, and may not be suitable for everyone. Listener discretion is advised. Just after 5 p.m. on a Wednesday in early fall, Aaron Kreifels left his college dorm in Laramie, Wyoming, to go for a bike ride. The University of Wyoming student wasn't headed anywhere in particular. He just felt like taking a break, so he paddled up to the top of Cactus Canyon. On his way back down, he got a bit lost and just randomly picked a dirt road, hoping it would take him the right way. But soon Aaron found himself in trouble. First, deep sand, and then he hit a big rock. He flew over the handlebars and landed on the ground. As Aaron stood up and dusted himself off, he noticed something lying near a fence. He thought maybe it was a scarecrow or some kind of Halloween gag. But as he got closer, Aaron saw human hair. At the top of his lungs, he yelled, hey, wake up, hello. There was no response. The person was alive, but just barely and didn't flinch. I'm Kathy Kinzora, and this is History of the 90s, a podcast about a decade that changed the world. On this episode, we go back to 1998, when the brutal murder of a college student stunned the world and ignited a movement that would change gay rights in the United States. This is the story of Matthew Shepard. Matthew Shepard, known as Matt to his family and friends, was born in 1976 in Casper, Wyoming, the capital of the state's oil belt. He lived there until his junior year in high school when the family moved to Saudi Arabia when his dad, Dennis Shepard, took a job as an oil rig safety inspector. Following the move, Matt was sent to Switzerland to complete his secondary education at the American School. After graduation, Matt returned to the U.S. and attended college in North Carolina. It was during this time that he came out to his parents as gay. Then Matt enrolled at the University of Wyoming to study political science with a dream of one day working as a diplomat for the State Department. He was one of the smartest guys I knew. He was he was on intellectual. He loved theater. Uh, theater was a big thing for him. He was a small, petite guy. He was super, super nice. That's Jeff Mack. Today, he is the executive vice president of the Matthew Shepard Foundation. But back in 1998, he worked at the University of Wyoming's admissions office. He became friends with Matt after meeting at the university's Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Association. The LGBTA was a group open to students, staff, and local townspeople. Jeff says Wyoming in the 1990s wasn't exactly a welcoming place for gays. There, there were there were hot pockets all over the the country that you know, people always felt comfortable to go to: San Francisco, L.A., New York, Palm Springs. Growing up in Wyoming, there wasn't a single gay bar. Wyoming has long had the nickname the Equality State because it granted women the right to vote in 1869. But in the 1990s, it was one of eight states in the U.S. that didn't have hate crime laws in place. That's because Wyoming's state legislature repeatedly voted down hate crime legislation on the grounds that it would give homosexuals special rights. Marv Johnson, executive director of the Wyoming chapter of the American Civil Liberties Union, told the New York Times in 1998 that Wyoming is not really gay-friendly pointing to a legislator who compared homosexuals to gay bulls, which he called, quote, worthless animals that should be sent to the packing plant. Laramie, which is a university city in central Wyoming, was considered one of the more liberal areas in the state, which allowed for a slightly less restrictive lifestyle for members of the LGBTQ community. We didn't hide it, but we didn't flaunt it. You know, so we'd all go out and you'd see a table of us sitting at one of the restaurants and you know you could tell because there was a good mix of people and we didn't have to code switch when we were doing that but you know in in other environments you would 
On the night of October 6, 1998, Matt went to one of the places where he felt relatively safe. The Fireside Lounge, a dive bar, was a frequent hangout for both college kids and rodeo cowboys, gay and straight. Matt had attended a meeting of the LGBTA on campus to iron out some last minute details for Gay Awareness Week, which was scheduled to begin the following Monday, coinciding with homecoming. Matt tried to convince others to join him for beers, but ended up heading to the Fireside Lounge solo. He had been struggling with depression since arriving at school. After years of living abroad, he felt isolated in the small city where fall entertainment revolved around homecoming, university football games, and the start of hunting season in the nearby mountains. Plus, Matt had already been dealing with a traumatic experience he suffered in high school. While on a class trip to Morocco, Matt was sexually assaulted. Matt's mom, Judy, said in a 2001 Global News interview, her son wasn't the same after the incident. It changed all of our lives forever, actually, because then Matthew just became different, um, more, more resigned, more reclusive, uh, sort of afraid of crowds, and it just changed him. We would hope, given time, you know, that he would be his old self again, but of course didn't get that time. That night in October 1998, Matt arrived at the Fireside Lounge and started chatting with two roofing workers, Russell Henderson and Aaron McKinney, who are also both 21. What happened next has been pieced together from statements Henderson and McKinney made to police. And a warning, what I'm about to tell you is at times graphic and disturbing. After chatting with Matt for a while, Henderson and McKinney went into the bathroom and came up with a plan. They would act like they were gay to gain Matt's confidence and then lure him into McKinney's pickup truck so they could rob him. In a police confession, McKinney said that once in the vehicle, Matt put his hand on his leg. That's when McKinney says he turned to Matt and said, guess what, we're not gay and we're going to jack you up. Then McKinney pulled out a gun, beat Matt, and took his wallet, which contained $20. They drove about a mile out of town, eventually heading down a dirt path that ended on a rocky prairie filled with sagebrush and range grass. Matt was pulled from the vehicle and tied to a log fence with a clothesline. Defenseless, he was ferociously pistol-whipped with the butt of a large Smith & Wesson revolver. McKinney struck Matt in the head and face between 19 and 21 times. McKinney and Henderson then stole Matt's patent leather shoes and left him tied to the fence in the middle of nowhere in near freezing weather conditions. 18 hours later, Aaron Kreifels rode by the area on his bike. The, the bicyclist that saw him thought he was a scarecrow at first and then got up closer and saw that it was a person and that his face was covered in blood and there was a a single no blood because of where the tears had gone down his face. Matt was alive, but just barely. The first officer on the scene, Reggie Flutie, attempted to open his mouth to clear his airway, but it was clamped shut. As the officer waited for an ambulance, she urged Matt to hang on, whispering, Baby boy, I'm here, kiddo. You're going to be okay. Don't give up. You can do this. Jeff Mack was six hours away in Jackson, Wyoming, for work when his boss Kathy called with the news. And Kathy said, Jeff, would you would 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 you please sit down? And I go, Kathy, what? She goes, I have something to tell you, and I just really would like for you to sit down for this. And so I sat down and, and she said, Matt was found tied to a fence post and beaten. And so I, I still cry about it. Um, and she said, cancel all your next meetings and come back. Matt's parents, who were living in Saudi Arabia, received a similar call. Judy Shepard says she immediately began asking questions. What are his chances? You know, where are you sending him? What can we do? And it took us quite a while to even get out of the country to come to him. So our biggest concern right then was, was he going to wait for us to come Mm -hmm. to him? Would he be able to do that? And he did. It was uh, was a very long plane ride. 
It took 50 hours for Judy and Dennis Shepard to make it back to the U.S. And when they finally arrived at Matt's bedside at a hospital in Fort Collins, Colorado, their son was nearly unrecognizable. His face was swollen, covered in bandages and stitches, and there were tubes everywhere. But one eye was partially open, revealing an unmistakable blue that Judy recognized. And because of the tubes in his mouth, Judy could see teeth covered in braces. The sight of the braces convinced her it was in fact Matthew lying near death in the hospital bed in front of her. But still, Judy found it hard to process what she was seeing. It's total disbelief that anyone would feel that much hatred for this tiny little person, this tiny, sweet, kind, smiling individual who would not in a million years ever hurt anyone. We just couldn't understand what kind of violence, hate, emotion drove these two young men to do that. Uh, and really still don't, don't understand that. Matt had not only suffered a crushed brain stem, but he also had four skull fractures from the blows of McKinney's 357 Magnum. Laramie Sheriff Dave O'Malley said the only time he'd ever seen such dramatic injuries were in high-speed traffic crashes. To imagine this was done by a beating at the hands of another human being was incomprehensible. While Matt lay in a coma in an ICU room in Colorado, homecoming celebrations went ahead as planned at the University of Wyoming. But Matt was not far from many people's thoughts. Jeff Mack says members of the LGBTA marched in the homecoming parade wearing yellow armbands in his honor. It was the very last part of the parade and people were carrying a big banner of it. And as people, as it walked by, the crowd just started walking behind it. And so, you know, it started out as, you know, dozens of and dozens and dozens of people behind it. And then it ended up being hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people walking behind it and just showing because the community was was in disbelief. At the homecoming football game, 15,000 people stood in silence for Matt. Meantime, in Colorado, Judy and Dennis Shepard continued to keep vigil at their son's bedside. But he did not regain consciousness and died on October 12th, 1998, five days after the attack. Matthew Wayne Shepard was 21 years old. When Matt succumbed to his injuries in hospital, Aaron McKinney and Russell Henderson, the two men who lured Matt from the fireside lounge and then viciously assaulted him, were already in custody. On the night they attacked Matt, they drove back into Laramie and picked a fight with two young Hispanic men who were walking down the street. One of the men fought back and hit McKinney in the head with a stick, causing a skull fracture. Police who happened to be in the area responding to another call stumbled on the aftermath of the fight. Officers searched McKinney's vehicle and found Matt's ID and the bloodied pistol. But unaware of Matt's assault, police simply sent McKinney to hospital, where he was treated and released. After leaving the hospital, McKinney and Henderson returned home, and with the help of their girlfriends, 20-year-old Chastity Pasley and 18-year-old Kristen Price, they disposed of their bloody clothing. Later that day, after Matt was discovered tied to a fence, police came knocking. The young women initially lied about McKinney and Henderson's whereabouts in a failed attempt to create an alibi. Today, two young men, Russell Henderson and Aaron McKinney, who whispered an obscenity as he came into court, were charged. In the county of Albany. Kidnap, robbery, and attempted murder. After Matt died, those charges were upgraded to first-degree murder. Their girlfriends were also charged with being accessories after the fact. In the days following the attack, the story made headlines around the world. The New York Times likened the killing to the Western custom of nailing a dead coyote to a fence to ward off intruders. Candlelight vigils and protests were held in communities across the nation. While celebrities took their own kind of action, Madonna complained to the University of Wyoming while Barbara Streisand personally called the Albany County Sheriff's Office in Laramie to demand action. When he was alive, Matthew Shepard was a shy, slight, little-noticed first-year university student. But in his death, he became a potent symbol in the fight for equal rights. 
You could really sense at the time that the shocking and brutal murder was a turning point. It was like everybody said, enough is enough. This was one of the worst anti-gay crimes in U.S. history. It launched a rallying call to end anti-gay violence and for state and national legislation to be created that would crack down on hate crimes. At the time, federal hate crime laws didn't include crimes based on sexual orientation. They only encompassed a person's race, color, religion, or national origin. And remember, Wyoming did not have a state hate crime law. Which didn't really matter because Laramie police fell short of calling Matt's beating a hate crime. They said while it was motivated by some anti-gay sentiments, it was mostly motivated by robbery. Jeff Mack says there was no question in his mind that it was a hate crime. The way he was found was, had to have been. You know, a, a, a mugging happens in an alley or on the street and, you know, you can beat someone down, but you don't drive them out to a remote place and tie them and beat them. You know, that, that is something that is fired by or fueled by hate. Two days after Matt died, politicians and other famous people gathered on the steps of the U.S. Capitol building in Washington, D.C. to address thousands of people who turned out for a vigil, including Ellen DeGeneres, who had made headlines when she came out as gay on her TV sitcom just a year and a half earlier. I am so pissed off. I can't stop crying. You know, I, I just, I, I mean, I know we all feel the same way, and I'm, I'm here, and I'm, you know, he's got these two close friends here, and I'm, I don't even know him, and I'm thinking this is just really selfish of me. I mean, what, pull yourself together, and, and it just hit me why I am so devastated by it. It's because this is what I was trying to stop. This is exactly why I did what I did. U.S. President Bill Clinton condemned the attackers as full of hatred or full of fear or both. Clinton and others at the vigil encouraged legislators to take action now on the act which had been languishing on Capitol Hill since it was introduced earlier in the year. But it would take several more years before lawmakers heeded the desperate calls for change. Twelve days after the vigil in Washington, on October 26, 1998, a funeral in Matt's honor was held amid an early fall snowstorm in Casper, Wyoming. Before the service, his father, Dennis Shepard, made a request through the media for a private and dignified farewell to their son. We should try to remember that because Matt's last few minutes of consciousness on Earth may have been hell, his family and friends went more than ever to say their farewells to him in a peaceful, dignified, and loving manner. But sadly, Dennis Shepard's request was dismissed. Reverend Fred Phelps, an anti-gay preacher from Kansas, showed up to protest outside the funeral with about a dozen of his followers, which included children. The group from Westboro Baptist Church held placards with unspeakable homophobic slurs and shouted to mourners that Matt was burning in hell. Police SWAT teams were positioned at the front and the back of the church, which had been swept with bomb-sniffing dogs, and police snipers were on guard on top of surrounding rooftops. In an effort to preserve the dignity of the service, scores of mourners formed a line between the demonstrators and the church, linking arms and singing Amazing Grace. Inside the church, hundreds listened as Matt's cousin, Ann Kitch, a pastor from New York, eulogized the young man. Kitch implored the mourners and the world at large to find in Matt's life a lesson that transcends the evil that caused his death. She called him a young man who met the world with eager expectation, who offered trust and friendship easily and lived honestly, and allowed people into his heart. Kitch said Matt has shown us the way, away from violence, hate, and despair. In April 1999, about six months after the funeral, a trial for 21-year-old Russell Henderson was set to begin. But before it started, Matt's friends learned that the same pastor who had protested at his funeral was planning to do the same outside the trial. This time, though, supporters were having none of it. 
they made giant angel wings that would block out the protest signs and placards. Wearing white outfits made from white sheets, duct tape, and PVC piping, they stood in front of the pastor and his followers who had gathered outside the court. It was dubbed the Angel Action and is remembered as one of the great counter-protests of all time. And it was even replicated in Orlando, Florida in 2016, after the same Baptist church tried to disrupt funerals of those killed during the mass shooting at the Pulse nightclub. Meanwhile, back inside the courtroom in Wyoming, things proceeded quickly when Henderson pleaded guilty to kidnapping and murder and avoided the death penalty, which could have been imposed if the case went to trial. Instead, he received a sentence of two consecutive life terms. Henderson admitted his role in the crime, but said he had not taken part in the beating. He addressed Matt's parents in the courtroom and looked directly at Judy and Dennis Shepard when he said, There is not a moment that goes by that I don't see what happened that night. I deeply regret what I did. I hope one day you can find it in your hearts to forgive me. When it was her turn to address the court, Judy Shepard said, with tears trickling down her cheeks, I hope you never experience a day or night without experiencing the terror, humiliation, hopelessness, and helplessness that my son felt that night. On the one-year anniversary of Matt's funeral, the trial for the other man accused in the murder began. At the beginning of the court proceedings, 22-year-old Aaron McKinney tried to invoke something known as the gay panic defense. He claimed that Matt made sexual advances and that pushed him into a state of temporary insanity that drove him to kill. At trial, defense lawyer Jason Tangman argued that McKinney had been scarred by a homosexual predator as a child and responded with what he called five minutes of rage and chaos when Matt made sexual advances toward him. The lawyer argued that McKinney did not intend to kill Shepard, and should be convicted only of manslaughter, not first-degree murder. But the judge barred McKinney from using the gay panic defense, and a jury found him guilty of second-degree murder. McKinney could have received the death penalty, but Matt's parents agreed to a deal that spared his life. Like Henderson, McKinney received two consecutive life sentences, and in exchange, he lost the right to appeal. On the day of sentencing, some jury members cried as Dennis Shepard addressed the court. I would like nothing better than to see you die, Mr. McKinney. However, this is the time to begin the healing process. To show mercy to someone who refused to show any mercy. He went on to describe his son as a trusting person who could see only good in others, who had nervously told his father he was gay, and who had paid a terrible price to open the eyes of all of us to the intolerance faced by the gay community. Following the loss of their son, Judy and Dennis Shepard became campaigners for gay rights. As a family, we we talked about, we couldn't understand the amount of press that was occurring and the letters and the flowers and the cards and the calls that were coming into the hospital, thousands and thousands. Uh, The profound effect he seemed to be having on the world was just staggering to us. I think in the recesses of our minds, we understood that we were going to have a national platform and we'd better use it. In December 1998, just two months after losing their son, Judy and Dennis established the Matthew Shepard Foundation, which funds various education programs about equal rights and offers, among other things, an online community for gay teens to discuss issues related to gender and sexual orientation. In the early days, one of their biggest goals was ensuring that federal hate crime legislation was expanded to include crimes based on sexual orientation. It was a long struggle to realize their goal, but in October 2009, Judy and Dennis were at the White House with then-President Barack Obama to see the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act signed into law. The act expanded the definition of violent federal hate crimes to those committed because of gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, or disability. Previously, only crimes motivated by the victim's race, color, religion, or national origin were considered a federal hate crime. The act also provides money and other resources to local communities and police forces to make it easier to investigate and prosecute hate crimes. And you probably noticed that the act was named after Matt and another man, James Byrd Jr. 
On June 7, 1998, four months before Matt's death, James, a black man from Texas, was brutally murdered by three white supremacists. Sean Barry, Lawrence Brewer, and John King dragged James for five kilometers behind a pickup truck. When they were done, the men dumped what was left of James' body in front of a black church. Brewer and King were the first white men to be sentenced to death for killing a black person in the history of modern Texas. In 2001, Bird's lynching by dragging led the state of Texas to pass a hate crime law, which was part of the inspiration for Congress to pass the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act. In addition to this groundbreaking legislative change, Matt's death also inspired scores of books, movies, and plays. The most influential has been a play called The Laramie Project. After Matt's murder, members of the Tectonic Theater Project went to Laramie and spent over a year interviewing locals. The result was a moving play that pieces together Matt's story in the residents' own words, a technique called verbatim theater. It has toured the U.S. and many other countries, telling Matt's story and encouraging campaigns against bigotry. And in 2003, it was adapted into an HBO movie. So what can I tell you about Matt? Well, manners, politeness, intelligence, taking care of me, has in tips. Not everything, he just offers conversation. He comes in, he's always dressed real nice, clean cut. Didn't seem to have any worries. It wasn't like he was waiting on anybody. He just wanted to enjoy his drink and the company around. In 2013, 15 years after Matt's murder, a new book about the case caused major controversy when it provided a completely different version of events. The book of Matt by investigative journalist Stephen Jimenez implied there was an even darker truth than had been previously revealed. Jimenez, who is also a TV producer, started out collecting material for a screenplay about the case, and he went into it believing it was a crime fueled by gay hate. But after spending 13 years interviewing more than 100 people connected to the case, Jimenez concluded that Matt's murder was not a hate crime. Instead, he blamed it on crystal meth, a drug that was flooding the Colorado and Wyoming area at the time. Jimenez claims during his research, he found that Matt was addicted to and was dealing crystal meth. It was an explosive allegation for sure, and the book went even further. It suggested that Matt actually knew one of his attackers, Aaron McKinney, and in fact, the two had previously been involved sexually and bought and sold drugs from each other. Jimenez goes on to say that McKinney and Henderson knew that Matt had access to a shipment of crystal meth worth $10,000. And that's the reason they lured him from the fireside lounge that night. Retired Laramie police officer Flint Waters told The Guardian in 2014 that he believes to this day that McKinney and Henderson were trying to find Matt's house so they could steal his drugs. The revelations in the book of Matt were met with a storm of criticism and anger. The Matthew Shepard Foundation has simply said it will not comment, indicating that it refuses to give oxygen to what it calls a completely false narrative. Author Stephen Jimenez, who is a gay man, says nothing in his book takes away from the brutality of the crime or the culpability of his murderers. But he says, we owe Matthew and other young men like him the truth. He says the reason people are so offended by the narrative that Matt had turned to drugs to cope with a life marred by violence and bigotry is because it takes away from the belief that Matt was a perfect poster boy for gay rights. And he says some within the movement didn't like that. Gay rights activist John Stoltenberg told The Guardian in 2014 that ignoring the tragedies of Matthew's life prior to his murder will do nothing to help other young men in the community who are sold for sex, ravaged by drugs, and generally exploited. He says they will remain invisible and lost. Since Matt was murdered, some things have changed for the better in the U.S. when it comes to gay rights. The Don't Ask, Don't Tell policy of the U.S. military was repealed in 2010, which allows gays and lesbians to serve openly in the U.S. military. In 2015, the Supreme Court declared same-sex marriages legal in all 50 states. But one thing that hasn't changed, Wyoming still does not have a hate crime law on the books. It is one of four U.S. states that don't have any such protections. 
The other three are Indiana, Arkansas, and South Carolina. And the gay panic defense still remains in 35 U.S. states. Only 15 have banned it. That means in those 35 states, a criminal defendant can claim that they found a victim's sexuality or gender identity so frightening that they were provoked into violence and can argue diminished responsibility on that basis. Plus, Jeff Mack says the Trump administration set the movement back as well. Administration woke up a hate rhetoric that was felt that could be unleashed, basically stripped the DOJ of any hate crimes work. Um, you know, and the, the current administration is doing great work with that, but, you know, trying to build it back up. And and now that we have these people who feel empowered to be able to speak against us, it is in, in some places terrifying. And following the recent U.S. Supreme Court ruling that ended Roe v. Wade abortion rights, there's also fear that the court might look at removing other legal protections unless they're codified into law, including same-sex marriage. In the 24 years since Matt's death, his memory lives on. In 2018, a collection of Matt's personal effects went on display at the Smithsonian's Museum of American History in Washington. Among the items donated by his parents was some of his schoolwork, theater scripts, photos, and a pair of sandals worn by the young man whose death inspired a nation to do more to protect its citizens from hate. The same year that Matt's belongings went on display at the Smithsonian, his cremated remains were finally laid to rest. Following his funeral, Matt's parents had kept their son's urn of ashes at home, partly out of concern that any memorial might be vandalized. Then in October 2018, 20 years after his death, Matt was interred at the Washington National Cathedral, a church that is considered the spiritual home of the nation. The shy young man now rests alongside other great Americans, including former President Woodrow Wilson and Helen Keller. At the time of the internment, Judy Shepard said, it was a huge relief to know that Matt will now be safe and protected forever. Thanks for listening to this look back at the life of Matt Shepard and the fight for gay rights that grew out of his death. Thanks also to Jeff Mack, Matt's friend, who is now the executive VP of the Matthew Shepard Foundation. His memories and information provided by the foundation helped to inform this episode. The clips of Judy Shepard were taken from an interview she did with Arlene Bynan for Global News in 2001. Judy remains board president of the Matthew Shepard Foundation and travels around the world advocating for equal rights. Judy and Dennis continue to live in Casper, Wyoming. I'll include info in the show notes about the Matthew Shepard Foundation. It's a great resource for anyone who feels disenfranchised or for those who want to help end discrimination. If you'd like to hear Jeff's entire interview, head on over to www.patreon slash history of the 90s.com. Patreon subscribers always get access to uncut interviews with guests from the show. Also look for History of the 90s on Facebook and Twitter at 1990s History and on Instagram at That 90s Podcast. This episode was written and hosted by me, Kathy Kinzora. Dila Velasquez is our producer and Rob Johnston handles sound design and final production. See you next time for more History of the 90s.